The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. John chapter 15, I'd like to have a look at this morning. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Well-known verses, a really great passage. It's a, a great book on this passage by a man by the name of Bruce Wilkerson called Secrets of the Vine. If you haven't got hold of that book, it was uh, by the author of The Prayer of Jabez. Many have heard of that one. It's a worth, very worthwhile book reading. It's not very long. You can read it in a, in a day, really. You can read it in a few couple hours, not even. And it's uh, really a good little book on this passage. Jesus begins by saying in the verse 1, I am the true vine. It's interesting, he doesn't just say, I am the vine, but he says, I am the true vine, which really suggests that there are other vines. There are false vines, there are fake vines, there are wrong vines. He says, I'm the true vine. He sees that men have attached their lives to other vines. But he begins by telling us here, I am the true vine. Don't be attached to a false vine. Don't be attached to a lying vine. Don't be attached maybe to what's actually a fake vine. Don't be attached to any other vine than Jesus Christ. Really, everybody attaches themselves to some vine. Anyone that's at least living and trying to live hasn't given up on, on life totally is attached to some sort of vine. They've made something their source, something that they believe they depend upon. But Jesus is telling us, I am the true vine. You know, what have we made our vine? What do we notice other men and people make their vine? Some people, it's their family is their vine. That's their source. And that's what, that's what comes first. And some of them can be Christians using the Bible to justify the place that they've given family in their life. Some people, it is their religion. It's their rules. It's keeping. It's doing. It's all, doing all that God expects us to do is really the vine that they attach themselves to. For others, it's uh, <clears throat> another person in their life. It can be one individual becomes their vine. And they attach themselves to that person and now they're completely dependent upon that person. Be that their husband, their wife. Sometimes it can be a friend. Maybe it's a parent. Sometimes it can be a child or our children that we actually make life all about that person. And the source of life is, is from and through that person. Sometimes it's money. And in this society, I think we live in a society that's, that's trying to tell us all the time and just from the advertising, the way we live, money is the source. Money is the vine to attach yourself to. We live in a society now that, you know, maybe 50 odd years ago, if, you, if your morals slipped, if, if you um, weren't faithful perhaps in your marriage or to your wife, you know, it disqualified you in many ways. The, the moral standards were held up as something very important. I'm not even necessarily saying that in itself is right, but their moral standards were held up very important. Codes of conduct, moral standards, morals that had been based on the Bible. And no doubt they had become a vine in themselves. But not today. You can mismanage your personal life. That's not an issue. It's whether you mismanage the money. That's the real issue. And you can be a great leader, but don't mismanage your personal life. I oh, don't mismanage the money. If you mismanage the money, then you're not a suitable leader. With all the um, things, even you look at politics today and all the things that they try to throw at whoever, whichever government is in power at the time. And they try to throw things at them to, and accuse them so that you know, we'll change our vote to the, the alternative government, or the, we call them the opposition, not to the government. But you know what? While people's wallets are okay, 
<laughs> they're not really going to change the government. When it starts to hurt their wallet, then they're no longer interested in that, maybe that Premier come Prime Minister come local council leader and his team because now they're hurting my wallet. But if my wallet's okay and things are growing, it's hard to budge them. You can throw, they can throw everything at them about their personal lives, about even maybe the way they've conducted themselves in different ways, but until it's hurting the wallet, it's often no change. Because that's what really matters to people. It's very important to them. They, that's become their vine. They, almost, they see their, their money, and we're encouraged to see our money really as a part of ourself, an extension of ourself. So, you know, if, I, if you cause me to lose some money, it's like you've caused me to lose a limb. Because that money is, I've, I've made that money. That's mine. That's me. That's, a, that's almost like a part of me. And some people can feel that way about their family. Some people can feel that way about their position. Their position in life, their, the place they hold, this position they hold has become their, their vine. It's become what, what's all important to them. It's become their everything in life. Their power that they have from the position they have in, in ministry, for that matter, in politics, in business. For some people, they'll, they'll put everything at risk. They'll go out and risk mismanagement and they'll do all that they've got to do. They'll put everything at risk to try to hold on to the image of position and power that they appear to have. That's, that's so important to them. And we see people get themselves in so much trouble because they make that their vine and it doesn't matter what, they'll do whatever they've got to do to try to hang on to that position and power. So yeah, we can make all sorts of things the vine that we attach our life to. And that's what Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine. He's letting us know you, that people attach themselves to other things, but I am the true one. I'm the true person. I'm the true vine that you need to attach your life to, the true source for your life. And then he tells us in the same verse that the father is the vine dresser. So when Jesus is the true vine, then the person who takes care of the vine and me and my relationship to the vine, I'm the branch, Jesus is the vine. The person who takes care of that, the person who's responsible for it and, and overlooks it, if you like, the chief farmer, if you like, the vine dresser, the one responsible for the, the branches attached to the vine of Jesus and their care and their upkeep is the father. He is the vine dresser. So if the father is the vine dresser, for those of us who are attached to Jesus as the vine, who's the vine dresser if you're attached to one of the wrong vines or another vine or any vine apart from Jesus? There's a vine dresser for that too. And of course, it comes in all different maybe names and titles and spirits, but basically it's the devil. He's the vine dresser. He's the one that does and, and will put the demands on the branches that are attached to the wrong vine. And so the, the things you have to do, the code of conduct, what's important, the things you've got to cut out of your life, as we're going to see that there are times when the father vine dresser prunes us and cuts things out of our life. Well, if you're attached to the wrong vine, then there'll be a vine dresser. There's a spirit, there's a, a code, there's a message. There's a way of living that life attached to that wrong vine, fake vine, that is like a vine dresser that will tell you now, this is what you have to do, that's what you have to do. And you hear people talk that way. I have to do this and we have to do that. You have to do this with your money and you have to do that with your family and you have to do that in business. All these have tos. Who said we have to? Jesus, over money, he called it mammon. Mammon has this code of conduct. Mammon has this, tells us what we can and cannot do with it. And it becomes like the vine dresser that dictates the way our life lives. Sometimes it's religion that will dictate the way our life lives. People who don't know God at all but will absolutely go ballistic if their children or someone in their family you know, gets baptised outside of their church. They have no idea what it means. But how you know, they're ready to you know, shoot people and stab people and, and, and fall on the ground and have fake heart attacks because their children are daring to go to another church. Because the, co the code says, the vine dresser says, the spirit over that way of thinking says you don't ever leave the church. The church that you've only ever heard your parents criticise all your life. You can never attend it, but you can never leave it. You can never go there, but don't go join another one. Very strange, but that's what, of course, the vine dresser of that particular vine says. And gives out his laws and gives out his rules and tells us what you can and cannot have in your life. Money, the same. If it's all about family, the same. There's this... There's this vine dress, there's this vine now that people attach themselves to and it's this kind of, you know, living for your children where people just spend their weekend driving around in their car taking their kids to sporting events 
and having them in clubs and having them in, we have to, they have to go to this and they have to go to that. Mothers run ragged trying to get their kids to all the things that they have to get them to because that's what the vine dresser is saying. That's what, that's the code. That's how you conduct yourselves. And you have to give up this and not do that because you've got to do these if you're going to be a good parent. The good parent vine, the good Aussie family, the good Western family style vine. You have to do this and you have to provide that. Got to have these things. Things you've got to have. Another vine tells us we've got to have these possessions, we've got to own these certain things. There's a sense of shame if you don't have these certain things or haven't achieved these certain things in your own, perhaps, assets or whatever it is. Really, when we think about it, you know, often we, we talk about wanting to be free and I don't, want, you know, I don't want the church to put conditions on me and I, I'm free, I don't have to follow Christianity and I don't want Jesus to put conditions on me. Well, you've just, if you're not attached to him, then you're attached to somebody else. The truth is we're all attached to somebody. Nobody's truly a free spirit. They think they're free, but they're just following some other code. They might be free from Jesus' code. Oh, I admit it. They might be free from the Father as their vine dresser. That's true. But they've got another one. They're attached to a vine, and there's a vine dresser telling them what they can and cannot do, and they're busy telling me what that is. We're branches. You can say, well, I'm not attached to anyone. Well, if you're not attached to anyone, verse 6 says you're lying on the ground withering up. You're attached to something. You've made something what you, what's valuable to you. You've made something decide what you, you measure as right or wrong, what you are comfortable with or what you choose or you don't choose to do. But Jesus tells us that he is the true vine and the Father is the vine dresser. Christ is the one that we should be attached to. He tells us every branch in him that does not bear fruit, he takes away. This is one thing that uh, those of us that uh, first time I ever saw it was in that book that I mentioned to you, The Secrets of the Vine by Bruce Wilkerson, that he explains this verse takes away and he says that he, un- he came to understand it when a vine dresser, a man that worked in the vines, explained to him that when they come to a vine that's not bearing fruit, it's, lying in, it's generally lying in the ground or it's not getting sun, there's some reason it's not bearing fruit. They don't chop it off, they lift it up. And my Bible even puts a, a reference to this phrase, every branch of me that does not bear fruit takes away, and it actually says to me, or lifts up. When it means takes away, it means lifts up, moves away, moves it. It's not takes away as in cuts off, and we see pruning mentioned in the next verse. So it's not, uh, this isn't about pruning, this is about actually lifting or moving, reattaching to the vine, cleaning it up putting it in a place where it's now going to be more able to bear fruit because it's fallen in the dirt, it's gotten dirty, it's gone underneath, the sun's not getting through to that particular branch on the vine. And so it moves it, it reattaches it. Often it's covered in dust and dirt, so they'll actually wash it and clean it and reattach it. And that's what Jesus does for every branch in him that does not bear fruit. He looks to clean them up, clean it up, reposition it, Bruce Wilkerson goes on and talks about being like the discipline of the Lord. This is where he wants to come in and clean up our life and wash our life and reposition us in life and tell us to put ourselves in another place and do something about the things in our life that are preventing us from getting um, the sun that we need and the things that we need to bear fruit on the vine of Jesus. It's actually very beautiful. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. The ones not bearing fruit don't get cut off. They get cleaned up, they get lifted up, they get repositioned, they get looked after. And then he goes on and says, and every branch that does bear fruit, that's the ones he prunes. The ones that aren't bearing any fruit, this is not about going around to chop you off, this is about now I'm going to come and minister to you, I'm going to come and clean you, I'm going to come and lift you up, I'm looking to do, put you in a better place, I'm looking to minister in your life to receive fruit from you. Good message to anybody that's in ministry, any elder or pastor, anyone that's trying to help somebody. What God wants to do with this person is wash and clean and reposition them so that their life may bear the fruit of Christ. He's not out to cut them off. Look after them. The, the, the branches that do bear fruit, it says he prunes. These are the branches now that are strong enough and ready to handle the pruning. These are healthy branches, they're bearing fruit, but now he's actually going to prune them. He's going to cut off 
anything or any part of that branch that doesn't bear fruit. He's going to cut out of their life whatever's not necessary so that more fruit can grow in that place. He's going to cut the bits off that aren't necessary, the bits that are maybe hindering the ability for, for fruit to grow. They may not even be bad things. We're not saying you're not cutting off wicked things. They might even be dead things. But he's going to cut off anything that isn't bearing fruit simply so that more fruit can be born, so that there can be more fruit. So he picks up the fruitless ones and cares for them and washes them and carefully repositions them. But the ones that are bearing fruit, he prunes them because they have got things happening on them, so he prune them. Maybe again, he'll, he'll cut out something that's interfering with the sunshine, interfering with, the, with the, that branch getting more sun or more water or something that's uh, a, a leaf that's growing that isn't going to bear fruit, so he'll, he'll cut that off so in that place can grow something that will bear fruit. He's going to do the pruning. Needs to be happened so that we can receive more fruit. For God to bless you, he's going to prune you to allow for more blessing to come. Asking God to bless you brings on pruning. Asking God to bless you more will bring on pruning. And the truth is anyone here with a testimony of, of how God has blessed their life will have also a testimony of the pruning. Of the, of the difficult times they went through. Pruning hurts. And sometimes while we're being pruned, we can think we're being punished. Don't mistake. Pruning is not for punishment. Pruning is for our benefit. Pruning is God dealing with the things in our lives that, are, that are, will hinder more opportunity for more blessing, more growth that we are looking for. The more of Jesus we're looking for, the more of the blessing in our life that he's looking for. If, if part of that fruit is blessing our business, then there must be something he needs to cut. There must be things that maybe that are in our life that he needs to, re to, to remove so that we can receive that blessing financially, receive maybe that blessing in our family. Maybe we're looking for him to bless our relationship. We want our relationship. We want our marriage to be a really good marriage. You want to get married and have a really good marriage. Well, then there's maybe, well, things in yourself that aren't necessarily wicked in themselves, but I tell you, they're going to get in the way of a good relationship. Because it's not about, oh, I've got to get this out of your life because you're breaking some rule or it's bad. Or we always love to use that word, it's wrong. Don't have the time today to go over again. Galatians, Romans, the very clear instruction from God, there is no more law, there is no more rules. There is no more condemnation on you because there's no rules by which to judge you. God has no rules for your behaviour. But if you're going to give yourself and you're going to be attached to the vine, then he's going to come and deal with those things in your life that will get in the way of, the, of more fruit growing in your life. And of course, you can think, well, why am I going through this and they don't seem to? Well, it's time for you to be pruned in this area. Maybe their time hasn't yet come. You're seeking for God to bless you in a particular area. Maybe where the, the, the area that he's blessing them or that they're going to receive an increase isn't where you've even asked or your, your God's plan for you to be increased. If yours is in personal business, then the pruning's going to be different than maybe than the person where their area of blessing maybe is in perhaps ministry or at this point in time with their family, their children, their marriage relationship. Where is, what area of this branch is God looking for more fruit to come? What area of this branch, if we asked him to bring more fruit, he's going to come and prune that area so that more fruit can grow. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Every branch he bears fruit that it may bear more fruit. And sometimes we can look across the things that have happened in our life and they were actually God pruning things out of our life. Maybe taking people out of your life that are not wicked, bad, evil people. You're not breaking some law from God, but you're wanting more blessing from God. And he's saying, well, that person needs to go. That, the way you rely on them, the way you listen to them, the way they dictate to you what you think, the way they affect your emotions, the way, that the, the, the way this relationship is, maybe they don't have to go, it just has to change. Maybe, it's something to, maybe it is something to do with something financial that you completely hang on to and he says, well, I'm gonna, you're going to lose that so that in losing that, there's going to be space for now my blessing to grow rather than what you've been hanging on to. Maybe it'll be some ability that you have that suddenly won't be as good as it was because you've always relied on the ability and it hasn't been a, a place where God can grow and, or bless you because it's all been relying on you. It could be whatever God sees needs to be pruned out of your life. It might be time to get that habit out of your life and deal with it. Not because you're breaking some law, but because you're wanting blessing 
You're wanting blessing in a relationship. You're wanting blessing in an area of your life. And God's saying, I want to bless you too. And I'm, and I'm really pleased with what the fruit you're growing, but I want more too, so I've come to chop that out. Come to deal with that so that that blessing that you and I are seeking for can grow in our life. Asking God to bless you brings on pruning. Lifting up and cleansing removes the dirt of the world, removes the dust of the world, removes the muck off us, removes the effect of we live in a world of sin. It affects us, it dirties us, it drags us down and sometimes we're in the dirt and there's no, nothing happening in, in, your, in our lives. And we can have people that we're ministering to in our church. There could be people here this morning that are in the dirt. They need to be washed and they need to be cleansed. They need to be lifted up. Careful, some other Christians want to run around and cut them up and prune them. But they're, too, they're not in a place for pruning. They're, they, they're too delicate. They need to be lifted up, reattached, cleansed, put in the sunlight, given some extra water. They need the care that's going to cause now some fruit to grow. And when some fruit's growing, the vine dresser knows the right time to start pruning when the fruit is growing. Lifting up cleanses, removes the dirt, the world and sin, but pruning cuts out what might be okay, but is in the way. It might be okay, but it's in the way. That's what uh, that work does. Verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. The, su the supply, the resource, the power, the instruction that we need to bear fruit all comes from the vine. And so we need to stay attached. We need to stay abiding in Christ. We need to stay living in him. We need to stay listening to him. We need to stay applying his word and allow him to do the pruning that he needs to do in our life. You know, there's a lot of trust in that situation. Sometimes we can be thinking, why is this happening? Why is this happening? If you're walking in Christ and you're abiding in him, when that pruning comes, you, just, you need to trust him and, and leave your life in his hands. It's interesting in this verse for abide in me and I in you. He doesn't ask us to do any work. Jesus has painted this picture of the vine and the branch. What does a branch do? It simply attaches itself to the vine. And, it, and all we're being told in these passages is to stay attached. The only thing I see, the only thing that I seem to have the power to do according to these scriptures, these verses or this description of, of Jesus is to attach or not be attached. That's my choice. And all I've got to do is stay attached. And it's like, and then, then just attach yourself to Jesus, abide in him, receive from him and leave the rest to the, to the vine to supply you and the vine dresser to look after you. Just attach yourself to him. And that's why we'll say to someone who's, who, whose life does seem to not be um, creating any fruit or bearing any fruit, attach yourself to Jesus, abide in him, get into his word, get into his fellowship, heed what he has to say, get yourself to the communion, be with the Christians, get reading your word, to start to fill yourself up with him and, and he will begin to speak to you. He'll lift you up, he'll cleanse you and then the fruit will come. It's not about going out and doing anything. Branches can't make fruit come. All branches can do is attach to the vine and then the fruit will come on their branch as the vine feeds them and as the vine dresser looks after them. If they just attach to the vine and the vine dresser doesn't look after them, they'll start to deteriorate. Yeah, there might be some fruit for a period of time, but if the pruning doesn't happen over the seasons, the fruit will deteriorate. The pruning is required to keep the fruit going and the fruit increasing. But if you're not attached to the vine, the vine dresser can trim, trune, wash, pin you to the fence. But if you're not attached to the vine, you're going to wither and die. You have to both be attached to the vine and have the vine dresser coming and, and uh, pruning us and, and, if necessary, before that, washing us. All we're asked to do is abide. That's all we're asked to do is abide. And that's all we need to really be encouraging one another to do. Abide, abide. You know, sometimes we've got pruning advice. Sometimes we want to do the pruning. We want to tell the person what they need to change, what they need to stop. We just need to encourage people to abide in Jesus Christ. We just need to love them and encourage them. We just need to show them Jesus. As I said last week, we just need to show the life of Christ, the kindness of Christ. Let them experience him through us. And well, what do I got to do? Just come and abide in him. Come and live in him. Attach yourself to him. And we know that attachment comes, yes, from repenting and being baptised. That's the act of attaching myself to Christ. If you've done that, then abide there. Live in him and abide in him and remain attached to him. Verse 6 says, If anyone 
does not abide in me. Or verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If we're not attached to him, we can't do anything. Verse 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. If you're not attached to Jesus, he's saying, then you'll fall down like a branch. You'll, you'll be put aside. And when you're first put aside, you still look green. It looks okay. You, you've been cast aside because you're no longer attached. Come along and found that this one has fallen off. This one has snapped off. This one's no longer attached. So it's just pushed aside or left lying on the ground. But as the days go by, it slowly withers slowly with us and then eventually it's cast into the fire that's what's going to happen if we don't abide in christ and that's why i've got to be checking what vine am i abiding in what vine am i leaning on what vine am i depending on who am i looking to in this situation who do i look to in my life what governs what's right or wrong for me what's the who's the vine dresser over my life what spirit what code what organization what spirit in the world what voice is the vine dresser over my life? Who, whose opinion am I worried about? What comes out of my mouth? You can't do this, you have to do that, you can't do that. Well, whose voice is that? Is it my culture? Is it mammon? Is it religion? Is it Western society? Is it, is it Aussie thinking? Is it Western thinking? What is it? Is it money thinking? What am I saying? What, what am I, what, what, why am I fearing? what I'm now fearing? Why am I so maybe excited? Why am I so happy by what I'm happy? What makes me happy? What makes me sad? What am I abiding in? If it's not Christ, then eventually slowly I'm going to wither. And we can sit in church and, and I get these questions. What happened to that person? Where did they go? Well, they slowly withered. Yeah, they came and did the religion thing, but they weren't attached to Christ. And they slowly withered. Verse 7 is a verse that I shared with the students this week. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. What a wonderful promise from the Lord. What a powerful statement from God. If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. What a great place to be that whatever you ask for, when you ask what you desire, it's done for you. What a wonderful promise. There's no conditions on that except abiding. Abide in Christ and have his words abide in us. Ah, we abide in him and his words abide in us. What he says, it really shows us what the, um, the power of the word is. The power of the word is to clean us. It's the word that cleans us. It's the word that prepares us. It's the word that prunes us. It's the word that does this work. It's the word through which the Father will speak to. If we abide in him and his words, as we abide in him, we receive his words and we allow his words to abide in us. Whatever you ask, whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. You know, because what you ask, if you're in a place where you're abiding in Christ and his words abide in you, what you ask will come from that place of abiding in Christ. And then whatever you ask will be done for you because you will ask according, the Bible says, to his will because you're walking and abiding in his will. You're abiding in him. You'll know what his will is, that what, what you feel desiring to ask of will be a desire that comes from a place where you are abiding in Christ. So you're there running a business and then what, what you feel to pray and ask for God regarding your business has been led by the Holy Spirit himself because you're abiding in Christ. What you pray for your family as you run your, and you lead your family or you're part of a family, what you pray for your fellow family members is guided by the word that you abide in. And you know that you're going to receive, and there's a promise that what you ask, you receive because you're asking from God's will. You're asking from God's word. You're asking from a place where you're abiding in God. Your direction's coming from a place where you're abiding in God. And so that's the challenge to all of us, to be constantly abiding in him. Because if I, as I go out into this week, if there's decisions to be made, if there's things I need to ask God for, or I think I need to ask God for, you know, sometimes we can be attached to the wrong vine. It's telling us what we need, and then we're asking God for that. Wondering why he's not answering our prayers. Because what you're asking for is not come from your relationship with him, it's come from your relationship with his other vine. It's come from the mammon vine, the family vine, the culture vine whatever vine it is that you, you're depending on, you're looking to. 
whatever code it is that you've given yourself to, this conduct, this way of thinking, and you're saying it's really important and God needs to do this. God's saying, you, have, you, you are not in my will when you come to ask this question. You're not abiding in me. This, this prayer is not coming from my word being in you. It's from someone else's word. It's from someone else's ideas. It's from some other code of conduct, some other way of thinking. Because you say, well, I'm a Christian and I think this, then God should do it. Well, wait a minute. You need to be abiding in him. And, you, and it needs to be his words that abide in you for whatever you ask to be what God is going to then give to you and, and ask you for. I mean, really, Jesus was our example of that, wasn't it? He said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I'm in relationship with the Father and what I ask for is what he's told me to ask. I'm walking in relationship with him. I'm abiding in his word. And so he knew that, he said, I only speak what he tells me to speak. I only pray what he tells me to pray. So when a situation comes, if you're abiding in Christ and in his word, you'd, you'd say, Father, how do I pray about this situation? And he'll tell you how to pray. He'll even tell you how to ask him, what to ask him, which a good father does, doesn't he? He'll tell us, when you see this over here, just come and take it when you want it. But see this in the fridge, come and ask me before you take it. You teach, our father teaches us how to ask him. Don't ask me like that, ask me like this. Tells us what words to use. Don't speak to me in that tone, speak to me in this way. Or come and ask me, I'm talking in the human now, come and ask me at this time. Don't ask me now when I'm busy, come and ask me after. So we learn from our father. A good father teaches us how to relate to him, how to, how to respect him. And some of it will be, of course, to his own personality, idiosyncrasies, the culture that he came from. And if we're smart, we'll learn it and we'll put it into place so that we receive from our dad. Well, we have a father in heaven and he says that if we attach ourselves to his son and abide in him and abide in his words, whatever we ask the father through the son, we will learn, we will know that whatever we ask the father will receive. What a fantastic promise. We wouldn't want their children to grow up and this to be their experience, that whatever they ask, whatever they ask from God, you will ask whatever you desire. Whatever your child desires and asks from the father, it is done for them because they abide in his word. What a, what a place of peace, what a place of confidence to get up and go out into the week knowing that I'm abiding with Christ. So what, as whatever comes my way, as I, as I remain abiding in him and in his word, whatever I need, I'll ask. Whatever I, I desire, I ask. <laughs> it's not even just need, it's desire there. Because it's coming from that place where I'm in, in relationship with him. Because I've attached myself to the vine. But I just wanted to remind us this morning... Jesus says, I am the true vine. So let's be sure that that's the vine that we're attached to. The Father is the vine dresser. He cleanses, he washes, he lifts us up. He makes us a better branch. He puts us in a better place so we'll be a branch that bears fruit. If you're bearing fruit, brothers and sisters, and many people in this church bear fruit to the glory of God, don't be surprised. Don't think, well, what have I done wrong? Why is this going wrong? This isn't fair. If you're bearing fruit, the Lord says, I'm going to come and prune you so you bear more fruit. And I don't think pruning is necessarily pleasant. You're going to maybe come and cut some things out. And if, you've been, if you're genuinely seeking him to show more of himself to you, then there's going to be some pruning. If you're asking him to bless you, then there's going to be some pruning. And those who you know, have a testimony of a blessing, look back and think, yeah, well, God has pruned. There are things. There are people that I once with, I'm not with anymore. There were relationships that I had, and those might even be brothers and sisters. The relationship changed. Someone else might be having one with them, but the way it was with you, God says, you know what, this is in the way of what we're about to do. Maybe your attitude to certain things had to change. As I said, things that were in your life, he's pruned them. Well, brothers and sisters, he's gonna, he wants to continue to prune. So don't mistake um, God's pruning for some sort of punishment or some sort of even discipline on your life. It's actually, well, it was discipling, I suppose. It is discipline in a sense. It's preparing you to bear more fruit for him and to bring more glory to him. And that's how we, we need to trust him. We want our children you know, to trust their fathers. There are times when our dads make decisions when we're kids that we don't like. And they, make, and they want to prune things in our, in our manners, in our habits, in our attitudes to help instruct us and direct us from when we're very small. Well, we have a father in heaven that continues that process in our life of pruning us and cleaning us and making us people that can bear more fruit for him. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the words of Jesus. You're such a good description to us, Lord. You are the vine and we are the branches. And Lord, we just want to commit to being branches to that vine again this morning, to be attached to you and nothing else. Holy Spirit, 
Show us how to be connected to that vine. Show us if there's any other vines in our lives, Lord, that we have tried to attach ourselves to. Give us a recognition of those other vine dresses that would want to um, dictate how we live and what we do. We thank you, Father. You are the true vine dresser. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your commitment. As we've heard this morning, your grace, your undeserved kindness towards us, that you would make it possible for us to have this relationship, to abide in Christ and his words to abide in us. And then come to you, Lord, with our requests and know that you'll grant whatever we ask because we abide in Jesus and his words abide in us. Lord, give us understanding of what that means. Lord, our lives, we have many needs at different times. Lord, we, we often pray at different times. And God, we want that to be according to your ways and according to your will. We want to walk in relationship with you according to these words of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us understand to abide, what it means to abide in Christ. Help us understand what it means to have his words abide in us. I thank you, Lord, for the many testimonies in this room, Lord, of your fruit being born in people's lives. I thank you for those here, Lord, that are looking for you, God, to bring fruit in their lives, that need your, your clean and your repositioning, God. Bless them. Help us, Lord, that are their brothers and sisters and elders and pastors to be sensitive, God, to what you want to do in their lives, in each other's lives, God. And two, that, that this won't just be about ourselves, but we will support one another and we will encourage one another in the cleaning process and in the pruning process. And we'll rejoice in the fruit that we see on another's life rather than be jealous, God, because we'll know, Lord, you are working and we'll glorify you. The glory goes to you when there's fruit born. It's a good vine. It's a good vine dresser that produces fruit in my life. I just have to abide. And Lord, all the glory goes to you. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the donate button.